Great, and so next up we have Michael Gibson, who is an architect turned filmmaker turned game maker at Zap Dramatic. He'll be sharing inside the Haiti earthquake, which is trying to challenge our assumptions about um, relief work in disaster scenarios. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about the process that they use to incorporate, sorry I keep on blowing into that thing, incorporate raw footage, uh, as well as how they went about structuring um, the strategies and consequences within the simulation. Thank you. So I'm going to first talk a little bit about the challenge that we had initially with this particular thing because this, this uh, simulation was really uh, was made to be part of a, a documentary that was being shot and this, this documentary was um, really fired up and ready to go. It was, it was based with the, um, uh, the Red Cross and so what they, they had all of their financing in place, the cameras and every crew, and they were waiting for a disaster in, in the beginning of uh, the year of, of 2010. And they did not know where they were going to be going. They did not know what the disaster was going to be. They only knew that when it did strike, they were going to go. And so um, the Haiti earthquake struck, and they were down, uh, down in Haiti within uh, 48 hours starting to shoot. And my gig was that I had to come up with a, uh, well, a game uh, based on this stuff. And, um, and as the imaging started coming back and, and what was going on, it was pretty clear that we needed to almost have a disclaimer saying that this was not a game and that, that what we were dealing with here was, was something, uh, this, uh, uh, such a large human tragedy that we really didn't want to be scoring people um, for, uh, in how to, how to use it. And, and we were getting all of this confusing um, uh, footage. Um, we had over 200 hours of raw documentary footage uh, throughout Haiti, many of it uh, very graphic, um, and, and hundreds of different characters, most of whom we've only seen once. And, and for me, as a, as a um, you know, I've been coming from film where I've worked with a, a screenplay, and you know, and then you go and shoot what you want to shoot. But th this stuff was all just coming back, and we were saying, okay, how are we going to try and make sense of this? And um, so we decided, okay, well, we're going to go and find out at the ending. What is, our, what is going to be our learning outcome? Who is our, our target audience on this? And our subject matter experts were the Red Cross. So um, we started talking with them, and he said, what is it that, that you are finding on the ground that you would like to, uh, to express to our um, uh, uh, users? Uh, who are, and our target audience were people who are interested in uh, relief work and uh, disaster relief, uh, um, working for the Red Cross, working for the UN. And so the kind of surprising counterintuitive uh, uh, response that we got uh, was stay home. <laughs> uh, send money and stay home. Um, and that seemed to be a very unsatisfying uh, um, objective for us to try and you know, express to other people, but we said, okay, well, how, how are we going to um, express that if, if that is indeed uh, the learning outcome that, that should come from this? Um, so then we start looking, okay, so what are the false assumptions that, that uh, uh, people are making when they are seeking to get into this kind of relief work? Um, uh, about how they can make the best make an impact in, in something as, as horrific as, as Haiti. Um, and, and some of the assumptions are that, that if you are a, um, I mean, one of the things that we heard when we were down there, there was an orthopedic surgeon who came down who was one of the top orthopedic surgeons in uh, New York. And he's used to living, having a fully equipped operating room and uh, nurses and assistants throughout the whole process. So he arrives down there, and there's nobody there to help him. There's no, uh, he has no um, uh, tools of his trade, and he's um, actually um, not able to really integrate terribly well with, with what the, the Red Cross and the UN were trying to do. And so 
this assumption that just because you have a skill and you have a desire to help um, does not mean that it's going to actually translate into meaningful help when you get down there. I mean, when in Haiti, for example, there was the, all of the infrastructure was, was destroyed. The, the, you couldn't even get the container ships unloaded. The airport was destroyed. And so there was a real um, need to express that kind of uh, chaotic sense that was really on the ground in Haiti. And, uh, and, and when there were 700 different NGOs uh, at one point operating down there, trying to coordinate it, trying to get them gasoline so that they could move things around where gasoline was extremely scarce, became the thing that we had to express. And we had to sort of show those consequences of those um, assumptions that, you know, when you get down there you can do something. Uh, so that people can, can have the learning outcome that, oh my God, you know, I, I, I'm going to have to uh, join in with someone like the Red Cross or the UN and, and, and wait for instructions. So, in designing the simulation, I've always found that the best way to get people to stand up and pay attention is to get them to fail. So you get them to, to, to work with those assumptions that, that have, you know, got them enthusiastic. And, you know, we've heard earlier today that, you know, in a simulation, it's, failure is okay. And, in fact, it's, it's, it's desired because it makes you test yourself. And then when you do fail, you go back and re-examine what you, what you did, what false assumptions that you might have made that, that contributed to that failure. And in order to ensure that the, that the user will fail, we, we try to get the simulation to negotiate back with with the user to sort of mimic the rationalizing mental chatter that goes on in your head. You know, you're told, no, take your shipment, do not uh, just make an ad hoc distribution, take it to the UN, you know, get it sorted out so that they can uh, sort through the, 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 the stuff that you have and then make a, a planned distribution. But when you see all these people, uh, uh, you know, chasing after your vehicles, saying that they're hungry and starving, it's very hard not to want to say, you know, let's stop and give it to them right now because we're hearing stories that they've been, uh, that their warehouses are filled with, with stuff and people are starving and it's not getting out to them. But there was a reason for that. And again, that's what the, the simulation was designed to show what was really going on. Um, so in order to, now that we have a sort of a structure of what we want to say and how we're going to say it, we, we, we want to then tell a story. And in order to keep people going, we have a film, we have, we have a lot of filmed images um, with no sort of continuing characters, but we wanted to really tell a story from three different points of view. Um, and uh, the most sort of powerful story that we have sort of going into gaming and, and, and also right back to folk tales and, and, and fairy tales that we learn as children is the hero's journey. That is, that is you, the individual, going out, uh, encountering uh, uh, the dragons, slaying the dragons and marrying the princess in the end. And so it is that kind of a, a very satisfying and, and sort of deeply ingrained kind of story that, that we're used to and, and uh, is a very effective at, at, at communicating um, all kinds of different uh, um, learning outcomes. So we, we did it, we wanted to have it from three points of view, the survivor, the journalist, and the aid worker. And we wanted to show how, all, although all those three um, different points of view are, they're working together in the same, uh, for, the, for the same global objective, that independently they are also in competition with one another and making each other's lives differently. So when you're playing the game, you play it from the survivor's point of view and you encounter the journalist and the aid worker and they're, they're in competition with you. And, and then you see it from the aid worker's point of view and you see how the journalist is not helping things out. And then you see what the journalist is, you know, the, the objective that the journalist has and you to begin to understand the, the complexity of, 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 the, uh, of what's going on down there. So in order to sort of develop this hero's journey, one of the biggest problems we had, of course, was what I was saying with, with the uh, having no um, uh, sort of linking narrative to help us go through, no, no characters that sort of endured on that we could follow. So Vladimir Propp, um, wrote this, uh, did a study in, uh, and called Morphology of the Folktale, in which he sort of broke down um, 
uh, about 200 uh, Russian folktales into 31 story functions. Now, these functions are little elements that, that work together in a sequence, but are not necessarily dependent on, on context, on, on content itself. It is a function that has to happen. And so what, what this means is that we can start to knit together a story using, um, using the function in each one of those, those uh, uh, 31 story functions and tell a story from the hero's point, uh, point of view um, uh, using the footage that we have and, and, and allowing the audience to go along with it and understand it without having um, uh, a character to take us through. Um, so this graph is, is sort of a schematic of, of how we, we went about it. You can see the aid worker, the survivor, and the journalist on the left-hand side, and it's moving, the timeline moves to the right. The first thing you encounter, uh, this little gray uh, ovals there, um, each one goes in, and that's a, sort of a negotiation cloud that we created, where people could go on and, and uh, ask questions, could walk about, could, and, and it's very interactive in the sense that they could, they could make choices, they could, they could ask questions, they could get answers for some of their stuff, and they could get more information, they could prepare for what their, their objective was, and they can take a certain amount of time in there, and then the, the, uh, the simulation will uh, grab them and, and, and hit them with um, the villainy and lack, which is... Uh, that, that bar there, which will force them into making a strategic decision. And I'll, I'll explain that what, we, what we, we, we divided the sort of user agency into two types. One was strategic and one was negotiation. The, the, the negotiation part of it um, had no effect on the storyline. The storyline would just fold it back in on this each time and so that every user, no matter what choices they made, they would be hitting um, the same narrative arc as they went through. However, with the strategic, we only made two choices, which means that there was really only two endings that were possible, the favorable ending and the not so favorable ending. And uh, what we wanted to do was, was to, um, uh, let's see. Okay, so the, these, uh, sorry, can I go back one? Yeah, thanks. Um, so what we wanted to do is, is get them to as you can see, they make uh, either two choices, uh, uh, the good choice or the bad choice. If they make the, the good choice, we want to then get them to negotiate with them to try and make it into a bad choice. So that the intersecting uh, clouds uh, behind that, that bar in the middle there um, means that once they've made a, a choice, then they start interacting with the other, other characters, the survivor, the aid worker, and the journalist. And they get talked into doing something that is not the ideal. And, but it's, it's, a, it's a something that they think they already, you know, is what they want to do. And, and it's the mental chatter that goes on to sort of rationalize to do it, even though you may know it's wrong. Um, and then, ultimately, then there is the failing outcome at, at the end and then they go back and then they can re, um, replay uh, again now having been more, made more aware of where their assumptions were uh, led them astray. Um, so this is just a, a wireframe that gives you a, a sense of how um, a, a negotiation cloud would work in the sense that you can see on, on the left hand side here there's an awful lot of stuff you can keep going keep going and then you're slammed into uh, that great gray thing there with, with sort of a, a, uh, an inciting incident um, and, and, and an event that, that sort of drives the story forwards. And, um, and that continues until you are forced then into, you make a strategic decision, which then is, 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 is recalled in the brain of the, of the simulation and is then used um, to provide the, the uh, consequences at the end of the, of the piece. And so, one of the things that, again, is really important to sort of, when, when, when I realized when we were doing this, is that a user's uh, experience of a simulation, no matter how interactive, it is still a linear experience. And that is why we really wanted to have a story that, that, that had all of the sort of narrative arcs and flows that, that a good story would, but still allow people to have uh, user agency. And so that's why we really divided it into the two types, and the, the strategic 
and the negotiation. And, it, and it, as I said before, the strategic really just splits the, uh, um, is just, there's only two choices. And the negotiation will negotiate you into making the wrong choice. And then you will, you will hear all of the rationalizations that, that people will say for why they would make a wrong choice. And then you will uh, experience that negative consequence. And, um, and, and be able to do it again, understanding that and being aware of what you've, um, uh, what, what you've done. And then that's it for me.